All right. Well, hello, everyone. It's great to see you all on this uh, beautiful, beautiful uh, spring, almost summer afternoon here in Colorado, uh, almost hitting the 80 degree mark. Uh, my name is Angela Wood Madrid. I'm the president of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. And uh, I welcome everybody, not just from Colorado. I can see there are people from all over the country and maybe some other places that are joining us for this very special lecture tonight in which we are going to talk not about the artistic value, not about the historical value, but about the real value of maps from the monetary side of things. And we're going to introduce our speaker in a moment. But first, we're going to hear from our program director, Naomi Heiser, that has uh, several announcements of many talks that are coming up in a, in a month packed of, of, of map action. So Naomi, uh, tell us what's coming up on our society. Yep. Thanks, Angel. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, we're very excited to announce to everyone that Map Month is back this year. Um, and this year, it's a collaboration with History Colorado called Map Mayhem. I think that was their idea. Um, and it coincides with the exhibition at Col History Colorado of part of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, which is a very special um, exhibit, which you ought to stop by and see also if you're coming to the talks. So the talks are going to be four Tuesday evenings in May and at six o'clock. So please note that there's a different time than our usual talk. It'll be six instead of 530. And our speakers are four longtime Rocky Mountain Map Society experts. That would be Wes Brown, Chris Lane, Steve Hoffenberg, and Tom Overton. They each have a different talk and you can see the synopses of these on our website or in the newsletters. So I'm not gonna go over them now, but they're all gonna speak about a different aspect of the historical mapping of Colorado. Um, they'll be offered in person at History Colorado in the margin room on the fourth floor. So note that there's a different room than we've been meeting at also. And as well as on Zoom, thanks to Angel, who is now our technology expert and will be there um, broadcasting on Zoom and recording the talks too. So if you come in person, History Colorado would like you to register on their events calendar and get a free ticket. Um, it's free entry, but you will need a ticket to get in or they'd like to see you have a ticket. So please let me know if I can help you with any of these details. It's a little different than before, but like I said, it's on our website and it's in the newsletter. So hopefully you'll figure all that out. So tonight we're delighted to welcome Eliane Dotson. She's the owner of Old World Auctions, an auction house specializing in cartography. In her role, she researches catalogs and values around 2,000 maps each year. And before everyone logged on, she was telling us there's actually an auction tonight. So maybe you can tell us a tiny bit about that tonight also. Um, she's a member of our Rocky Mountain Map Society and the past president of Washington Map Society and currently serves as the webmaster for Washington Map Society. She has an MBA from the Darden Graduate School of Business at the University of Virginia. And her primary cartographic interest is maps by the Dutch masters from the 16th and 17th centuries. So now Eliane will help us understand what is your map worth and how to value your antique maps. Thanks. Yeah, let me just add that anybody that has any questions, just put it in the chat. Uh, just don't go overboard on trying to uh, um, appraise your your maps, but Eliane will do it the best that she can. So go for it, Eliane. All right, wonderful. So today I'm here to talk about how to value antique maps um, and. What I'm going to talk about here today will also apply for vintage maps, as well as atlases and similar types of cartographic material. So you can apply the same tips and, um, and process that I will talk about to all of those. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right in. So the first thing I just want to go over just briefly, this is what we'll talk about today. So the first thing is to talk about the different types of value that you might see because um, you'll see different types of values and they, they mean different things. And it's important to understand um, so that you can compare apples to apples. Um, then I'm gonna go over some of the main factors that affect value. Um, and um, then I will talk about the current and historical pricing for antique maps. So where you might be able to find some of that information. Um, and then we'll go through a couple of case studies, um, a common map as well as a rare map. So you can see how the process might differ for those two. All right, so the first thing to talk about is the different types of map value. Um, so the first thing that you'll often hear about is of course appraisal value, which is used for insurance purposes, estate settlements, charitable donations and the like. 
This is really how much it would cost to replace a map if you were to lose it or if it were to get damaged for some reason or if you wanted to you know, claim it um, for a, a charitable donation. Um, these are typically based on current sale prices and, and listed dealer prices. Um, and there are a lot of independent appraisal companies and, and map dealers who will offer this as a service um, if that's something that you're interested in doing. Um, the next type of price is a dealer price. So we all know lots of wonderful dealers and there are some on the, I could see on the um, list today of, of attendees. Um, and so a dealer price is gonna indicate what a map is worth in a retail environment. So they're they have to build in costs such as um, for marketing, for their retail location, um, the carrying cost of just owning the maps and, and, and you know, the, the money involved in that. Um, and these will depend. So the prices that you'll see with dealers are going to vary quite a bit based on where they're located and who their customer base is and what their specialty is. So a dealer obviously in London is gonna charge more for a map of London than they will for a map of South America. Um, and that's just what you're going to see. So you'll see a lot of pricing variation with a lot of dealers. Next, we can talk about auctions. And there are a couple of different types of pricing that you'll see with auctions. One is an auction estimate. The estimate is what an auctioneer will put together before the auction begins to give you a sense of where they think the value is of that item. Um, and that should give you a general sense of where the bidding might end up. Um, the one caveat to that is there are some auction houses that will place low estimates to encourage more bidding and to hopefully make it appear that their results are better than expected. Um, so you do have to take that into account and know the auctioneer that you're dealing with and how they tend to price items um, to get a better sense of where they compare with others. Um, an auction result is, of course, the price that you're going to have at the end of the auction, the hammer price, if you will. Um, and these can give a really good sense of what people feel that a map is worth at that given time. But the caveat to that is it is the value of that map at that specific time with that specific group of people that came to bid that day. So you will have very different results from one auction house to another, or even within the same auction house from one auction to another, because you just might have different bidders coming that day and that will impact the pricing and, and um, where it ends up at the, at the end. So when you're looking at auction prices, some auction houses will list their prices as the hammer price, um, and some will list it as the hammer price plus the buyer's premium. So essentially every auction house that I know of includes a buyer's premium, which is added on top of the hammer price and typically ranges between 15 and 30%. So you just have to be aware when you're looking at pricing from auction houses, are you looking at what the actual hammer price was or have they already added the buyer's premium to that result um, so that you're comparing the same things? All right, so the factors that affect value. Of course, supply and demand in any market in, for any type of item is going to impact value the most. All maps are not created equal. Um, so you have on the supply side, there's certain maps that were simply published more frequently. There might be, have been more copies that were printed and there are other maps that um, survived better over the years. And so there are more that are still available today. Um, that's going to impact the supply. To, in today's world, with the internet and the accessibility that you have in viewing so many different dealers' inventories, the um, inventories of auction houses, um, you actually have much more visibility of the inventory on the market and the supply that exists, um, which is very different from you know, 15, 20 years ago, in which that simply wasn't visible to most people. Um, because dealers wouldn't necessarily have all of their inventories listed online and you wouldn't know who had what. Um, on the demand side, some of the key things that we look at is that there are certain geographies that are simply more popular than others. Either they're more broadly appealing, such as a world map, or they might be maps of certain regions that have big collecting communities. So we tend to find with our auctions that Texas and California have really big map collecting communities. So those maps tend to sell at a premium to other maps. Um, the, the British Isles are very popular um, because there are a lot of Brits who love maps and collecting them. Um, and so the, that drives prices. Um, you also find that there are certain collecting 
categories like the island of California or the state of Franklin or sea monsters that people love to collect and therefore that drives demand as well. Um, and again, you can also find cartographers that are more popular than others. Um, my husband, John, actually wrote an article, which is, it's available on our website, and I can direct people to that um, if they're interested, on the difference between Blau and Janssen maps. So they both copied each other's maps. They often actually bought the plates, the exact plates from one another to print off of. Um, and yet Blau maps tend to sell at a premium of around 30% over Janssen. Um, and so it's just really interesting how there are certain people who are, are more popular and, and that will drive the price. So because antique maps are not a commodity, um, they're not all the same, even if they may look the same. Um, you can have two maps that are very similar and from a similar time period. Like here we have two lovely maps of Iceland, one from Ortelius at top and one from Blau at the bottom. But the Ortelius map, because it's much more ornate and more popular, sells for 10 times almost 20 times what the Blau map will sell for. Um, so before you start to embark upon um, valuing a map, if you have a map that you're interested in valuing, you obviously need to know the key details. Um, all of you are probably very familiar with these, so I'll just go over these really briefly, but um, certainly the title is one of the most important pieces of information. Um, the one tricky thing with titles is that you can sometimes have multiple titles. So you might have one that's in a cartouche on the map and another one that's above the map or below the map or even on the back on the verso of the map. So sometimes you have to search in different ways to be able to find comparable maps um, depending on how other people have listed them. The same goes with the creator. So we all know there's the map maker, but sometimes there are other, there are other individuals who are involved in the process. There could be the engraver, there can also be the publisher, the printer. So depending on which of those typically is the most influential, the most important, um, the most popular, they will typically be most closely associated with a specific map. But you may need to have, be aware of different people who are involved in that process um, when you're trying to find comparable examples. Um, the important thing about size is that oftentimes there are maps with the exact same title by the same map maker and they may have made a folio size version and then a smaller version. Um, so you need to know what size you're dealing with um, to make sure that you're comparing the same things. And then the final thing is to, to note any identifying marks on your map. There are oftentimes um, plate numbers or page numbers or text on the back of the map that can help you identify exactly which example you have to make sure that you are comparing it. So going on. One of the key factors that will affect value is the different state or edition of a map. So the edition, of course, is just a batch of impressions that's printed from a specific plate, and they change for each edition of an atlas. So for example, Abraham Ortelius, his atlas, Teatrum Orbis Terrarum, was published um, between 1570 and 1641 in many, many, in many editions. So they would take the plate, they would print a bunch of examples for the 1570 edition, and then a year or two later, they would print more copies for another edition. Um, and oftentimes on these, the text on the back will be reset or there will be different identifying marks. So even when the maps are taken out of the atlases, which I'm sure you all know that most maps these days that are sold on the market were removed from an atlas at some point, and so they're individual sheet maps, but it can sometimes be important to identify from which edition it was taken, um, because that can affect value. Um, usually first editions can um, make carry a premium in value, but not always. Sometimes there's an edition that's rarer than others, such as with Ortelius, there's an English, there's only one English edition. And so even though that was a later edition, sometimes that can carry a premium from um, earlier editions. Um, states are the significant changes that are made to the plate. So if they at change the cartographic information, if they touch up the image to improve it because it's worn down from printing. Um, sometimes they'll change the page numbers or the plate number or the text on the back of the map. Uh, actually, the text on the back doesn't change the state, but um, the map, ma map maker's name. So when um, Blau bought maps, um, copper plates from Jansen's um, family, he would change, his, change um, the name on the map from Jansen to Blau. Um, and sometimes there are changes in the title that can be of great value, such as um, maps of the United States, 
So either prior to the American Revolution versus after the first map that has when it's changed to United States instead of you know, the, the colony, the British colonies, that can be an important change that will affect value. Um, so major changes will affect value more. Um, some changes don't affect value at all. Um, so you, it's, you need to look at a lot of different examples to be able to understand which changes will affect the value more or not at all. Um, so here we have an example of a map by um, previously based, based on Sanson, but published by Jayo. This is the second state, which shows the island of California, which, as I mentioned, is very popular. Um, once you get 20 years later, it was updated to show that California was indeed a peninsula. Now, even though this map only appeared 20 years later and has potentially more interesting cartographic information in the interior of the United States, it is less popular because it doesn't show the island of California and tends to sell for about half of what the second state will sell for. So you can see the state can make a very big difference in terms of value. Um, a couple of other terms that you might, might come across are a restrike. That's when somebody takes the plate that was originally made and makes pulls another um, round of impressions from it, typically at a much later date. You can often identify these because they will be on a different paper. And sometimes they will have identifying marks to indicate that it is a restrike. Um, but that's something to make note of. And, and typically the paper is the most common way to identify those. Um, you will also encounter situations in which uh, two maps appear to be fairly similar. And the key is to determine, is it a new plate or were there simply changes made to the original plate? So this is an example where it is actually a new plate that was um, re-engraved on a, a, new, a new copper plate. Um, and two ways that I always use to identify whether it's a new plate or simply changes to the original plate um, the first one is by looking at the plate mark, right? So you can often see the ink pattern that will, the ink residue that will be along the very edges of a plate that will be um, pressed onto the paper. And if you can match up the shape and the size of those, that can help you identify if it was a new plate or not. The second um, tip, and this is a, a tip that I got from Philip Burden and it works very well. And that is in looking at the lines that intersect letters. So the typography, and here you can see on the left-hand side, can you all see my cursor? I don't know if you can see where I'm pointing. You can, okay, great. So here you can see in Canada, the, the line of longitude goes between the D and the A, whereas over on the right-hand side, you can see it goes directly through the D. And so looking for little um, differences such as that can help you determine if it's a new plate or not. All right, condition, of course, as everybody knows, condition is king and it impacts the value greatly of maps. Now, I personally, and you know, at Old World Auctions, we tend to look at imperfections that are within the image as affecting value, whereas those that are just in the blank margins outside of the image typically do not affect value much at all, um, unless they are issues that will potentially um, enter into the map image itself. So we really consider what would be viewable um, if a map was framed. Um, so some of the imperfections that you will come across. Um, first of all, you have a lot of minor imperfections in the image. These are typically ones that are inherent to the printing or paper making process. Um, and these, as long as they're not very distracting and don't cause damage to the map, they typically don't affect value very much, maybe five or 10%. Um, so some examples here are, this is printer's creases, which is where the paper got um, folded over slightly um, when, the, when the plate was being pressed onto it. And so you get areas where um, you don't have any ink showing, and that is because the paper had been creased. Um, another example is a binding trim. And that's what you see over here on the left. You can see that the margin was cut out and they would do that in order to be able to fold the map into a, a book or an atlas for it to fit properly. So that's something that's a normal part of the, the publishing process. Um, another example are little paper flaws. So during the paper making process, sometimes small particles would get into the paper and those then sometimes cause um, discoloration or sometimes even holes in the paper um, as it ages. 
You can also have a lot of major issues. And if it's something that's visible and distracting, then it will definitely impact value. So some examples of that are obviously stains. Um, you can have oxidation. This is something I'll talk about more when we talk about color. But um, oxidation occurs when the original green and blue pigments that they've used in the 16th to 18th centuries contain um, uh, pigments that would deteriorate over time. Once they were oxidized and in, in, um, in touch with oxygen, they would turn brown, they caused the paper to become brittle. And in this instance, you can see the paper is actually cracked and we've gotten a little hole because of the extensiveness of the oxidation. Um, so that happens with contemporary color, which is color that was applied at the time that it was published. Um, you can also have foxing, which are the little brown dots that you can often see. Um, toning, you will see that frequently, especially with some of the later wood pulp maps that you'll see it along the fold lines where it was folded into another book. Um, and that can sometimes be very distracting and also can eventually cause tears or, or separations along those folds. Um, damp stains, wormholes, um, and offsetting. So offsetting is simply when the, um, after the plate was printed onto paper, they folded it in half. And so you get that mirror image of the ink um, on both sides of the map. So again, it's important to assess the severity of the flaw and how much it impacts the appreciation of the map to determine how much it's going to affect the value. But um, it can affect the value 50% or even more, depending on how, how severe the condition issues are. Um, there are some types of maps for which condition won't be as important. Um, the key categories there are very rare maps, ones that may only come around every 10, 20 years you may just be happy to get it in any condition. And so therefore you won't worry so much about the fact that there are some condition issues here or there. Um, others are maps that are typically found in lesser condition. So I talked about wood pulp paper um, that tends to deteriorate more quickly over time. So those types of maps are, are not going to survive as well and just tend to be in worse condition. That also includes wall maps or anything that has been varnished. Um, and maps that were intended for heavy use, things that were intended for schools or um, to be used aboard ship, um, pocket maps of, and the like, those because of the, the usage of them, they're going, you're going to typically find them in worse condition. Now, of course, you can have professional conservation or restoration that can improve the condition um, and that, that or that will also improve the value of the map. Um, but if there are non-archival repairs, that certainly will decrease the value. So we see very often where people will take just regular tape, like scotch tape or a cello tape, to repair a tear on a map, and that will eventually eat away at the paper and cause even more damage than the tear did originally. So those will really decrease the value. Where I tend to see that the most is with maps that are in a frame. So I always caution people to, if you're going to buy a map, to try to examine it outside of the frame to be able to properly evaluate the condition. And that's because frames and the matting around the frame will hide more condition issues than just about anything else I see. So they, they actually hide and cause a lot of condition issues. Um, so you can see here, here's an example of a map that we recently had conserved. And you can see how much of a difference it can make um, in the, the visual impact of the map. But in this case also, the, map, the paper had become acidic and had turned brown and it was deacidified, which will ensure that the paper stays um, in better condition and will last much longer than um, previously. All right, um, color, which we, I mentioned very briefly before. Um, obviously some maps were intended to be colored, others were not, um, and so, if there is not color on a map, um, because that's the way it was made to be, some people prefer that. We typically find with our customers that modern color, which was added you know, within the last hundred years or so, um, it can decrease the map, decrease the value if it's not properly done, if it isn't done in the same style and in the same colors that were intended um, from when it was published. However, most of our customers tend to prefer colored maps because it increases the appeal of the aesthetics. 
of the map. So um, modern color doesn't always decrease the value. It can actually increase the value for maps that are more common that people really like to have the decorative elements highlighted in color. Um, contemporary color, which of course is the color that was added at the time that it was published, it almost always increases the value. The exception of course is those it, for which there is extensive verdigris damage um, that they've, they've oxidized. You can get a lot of cracking and holes and tears um, when that occurs. So that will decrease the value. Those maps you know, need to be properly conserved so that they can survive um, the, you know, the next few centuries. Um, and so that's an important thing to do if you have that type of a map. Um, now, the trick is that identifying whether it is contemporary color or modern color can be very challenging. The number one thing to look for there is look at other examples, especially examples that are still within an atlas or within a book. Typically those don't have modern color because it's a lot harder to color something that's still folded and inside a book. Um, so if you can compare examples with others and see exactly what types of colors they use, the shades of the colors, the way that they were applied, where they were applied on the map, that can help you identify whether something is contemporary color or if it may have been added at a later time. Um, here are two maps. Lovely, one of my favorite maps is um, Willem Blau's Map of the World. And these two examples, one of them is contemporary color and the other one is modern color. And as you can see, they both look lovely. They're both very nicely colored. It can be very difficult to tell which one is modern color and which one is contemporary. In this case, it happens that the one on the left is actually contemporary color. One of the ways that you can, other than by understanding who the publisher was or the map maker and how they tended to color their maps, one key sign can be flipping the map and looking at the back of it. On the verso, you will see that the blues and the greens will actually kind of bleed through. So you can see it's a mirror image of exactly where those blues and greens were applied on the front of the map, you're gonna see on the back. Um, and in this instance, even though it is bleeding through a little bit, um, this isn't extensive enough that it will impact the condition of the paper. And so if the paper is still supple and pliable, then this doesn't affect the condition in a negative way, but this being contemporary color will certainly add value to this map. And that's, a, that's one great way to be able to identify it. All right, format is another thing that will impact value. Some maps were published in multiple formats at the same time. So you might have a sheet map version and a wall map version and a pocket or a folding map version. Um, we tend to find that wall maps have the least amount of value because there's a much smaller collecting community for those because they are of course difficult to store um, and they're hard to display and they often were varnished which impacts the condition of them. Um, so here's an example of two maps that are nearly identical. The coloring's a little bit different, um, but in this case, it really was the format that drove the um, increase in value of the example on the right because it was a folding map version. And we do find that pocket and folding maps are quite popular among collectors. Again, you, they're much more compact, easier to store. You can put them on a shelf. Um, and so there are a lot of people who enjoy that type of a format. Okay, so once you've gathered all the information about your map, then you can have to need to take a look at pricing. Where do we look at pricing? Well, we search the internet. That's the main way that we look at it. Um, if you put, if you go to you know, Google or whatever your search engine of preference is, put the title in quotation marks, followed by the name of the creator. So whoever is the most person most associated with that map and, and search, and you will find lots of examples of, um, maps that either were offered by dealers or that have sold at auction. Um, and that will give you an, a sense of what the current pricing is. We also look at a lot of historical pricing databases and there are a lot of really good ones out there. Um, one is oldmaps.com. They focus obviously on maps. Um, they have around 200,000 price records and they actually show records from dealer listings, from dealer catalogs, as well as auction results. The only, um, issue is they haven't updated it in the last two years, um, but they can be a great resource for finding um, values of maps. We actually use most often rarebookhub.com. 
Now, unfortunately, both oldmaps.com and Rare Book Hub are subscription services. So you do have to pay in order to be able to check the pricing on items and to search. Um, Old Maps does have a subscription service, a seven day subscription service for around $20. Um, they also have an annual one for 120. Rare Book Hub has a 10 day subscription service for $65 and the annual one is over 500. So it's obviously a very expensive um, service to use, but you know, for someone like me who looks at map prices every single day, it's, it's an essential um, thing to have. There are other websites called, um, they're the online bidding platforms. So two of the biggest are Invaluable and Live Auctioneers. They are bidding platforms for auction houses. So either auction houses that don't have their own online technology, or auction houses that do have their own online technology but want to supplement it with a different um, customer base. They have millions and millions of records. They do cover many more categories. So it's all sorts of collectibles and art. So of those you know, 29, 66 million records, only a, a portion, a small portion of them will be map related. Um, Rare Book Up ha actually has a higher portion of map related results because they focus on um, paper and books and maps. Um, so they have a much higher percentage of maps within their records. Invaluable and Live Auctioneers, I believe that both of them, if you just create an account, so a username and a password, you can access recent price records. Um, and they do also have subscription services if you want to go back further and see um, price records from, from the past. So this is where we will typically go to get um, an understanding of both past, rec past prices as well as current ones. All right, so now that we've talked about all of the basic details, let's go over a few case studies, all right? So I'm first gonna go over just a, a relatively common map, um, a very lovely one. I'm gonna walk you through the steps that, that, you, that we take and that we recommend if you wanna value the map. So the first thing that you're gonna do is properly identify the map. So we talked about the key identifiers that are important. Um, there are a lot of reference books out there. You can see behind me, we have hundreds of reference books on maps. You can find lots of them at your public library. I'm sure Denver Public Library has a great um, collection of reference books. Um, some of them are available actually for free online. Um, and so there are a lot of great resources out there to use. You want to use the reference books so that you can help identify which state are you looking at, which edition, um, are there any key factors that you need to be aware of that might impact the value. Um, so on this one, um, I, you know, the map that you saw on the previous screen, I identified it to be, you know, it's by Ar Arnoldus Montanus. Um, this map was actually published, uh, there are three states, um, and they're identifiable by the paper on which they were printed. And this one I was able to confirm was um, by Montanus. Um, the step two then, once you've identified it, is to evaluate the condition. So this one is in very nice condition. It did have modern color, but it, it was well applied um, and attractive, had a little bit of soiling. I gave it in general a B plus. Um, we tend to grade things on a, a scale of um, you know, A plus to D. Um, and so this was kind of what I graded this map. The next thing you do is you want to look at historical sales prices. So this is actually a screenshot directly from Rare Book Hub. I plugged in the details of the map. You can see it's highlighted um, where it found my key terms. Um, and here you can see there's a range of pricing. So the key here is you do need to look at each of the individual examples and understand um, are they colored? Are they not colored? Are they a different state or edition that might impact value? Are they um, a different condition? So are they poor or poor condition or in better condition than my example? So that you can, um, so you can get a sense of where your example will fit among the different prices. So here we have prices ranging from around $250 to over $1,300. Um, Rare Book Hub does, like I said, it's all auction results and they always add in the buyer's premium to the hammer price. So all of these prices you see are apples to apples, because um, they're including all of the, the full price of the map. Um, if you look at individual, when I looked at individual examples, I saw that actually the lowest price one was framed and in poor condition. 
The highest price one was also framed in very nice condition. And that kind of, um, you know, helps you understand why the price was very, ended up being very low and very high. All right, so next we take a look at current market prices. So like I said, I went on to Google. I put the name of the map in quotes and the map maker's name. I checked the current market prices. I found a couple of examples that were available for sale. Um, here, you have to remember that it is a dealer price. So it's typically gonna be higher than what you'll find at auction. Um, and you can kind of take that into consideration with the past sales prices at auction. And I calculated the estimated value, kind of a range around 800 to 1100. So we always think of value in terms of range and you really should think of that when you're trying to value your maps. You're not gonna get an exact dollar value for your map, but it's gonna be a range based on who's interested in buying at what time, um, and what you might be able to get for it, depending on where you might go to sell it. So this is where I, what I got for this map. All right, so let's do another example. Um, here's another relatively common map. Um, so here I had some page numbers and um, volume numbers in the bottom margin, as well as the title, which helped me identify the exact um, edition and state of this map. So this map by Bellin, there are actually five different plates that were created over time. Um, not all by Bellin, but some by people who were copying his map. Um, and so on this map, I actually have created my own Carto bibliography because we come across this map so frequently. Um, and we've had it both in um, book form, you know, within the Atlas, as well as individual separate examples. So I've created a little Carto bibli bibliography and determined based on that, that this is the first of the five plates that was created. And it was the second state. Now on this map, I happen to know because I've cataloged it many times that the different states on this map are not gonna really impact the value, but it is good to know, um, to be able to know that. When I evaluated the condition, it's also in relatively good condition. I gave it a B plus, all right? So then I looked at historical sales prices and you can see again, there are lots of examples. This is just examples in the last two years. If I were to go back a full five years, you'd get another 30 or 40 um, examples that have been sold. Um, but for obviously space purposes, I cut that off. Um, the range of price here varies much less because it is a more common map. You're gonna see that the pricing is going to um, kind of mediate itself over time. Um, so it ranges from around $180 to $390. Um, again, you have to check which ones are in color, which ones are black and white, which ones are different um, states or editions. Um, and then you can take a look at the current market prices. So on this one, I found four different examples that were available for sale. Um, so taking all of that into consideration, as well as the auction um, results, I came at an estimated value of around 200 to 275 dollars. So that's the price that I would expect on a normal given day. This map would sell for in this condition, in black and white, at auction. All right. Well, there are also situations in which you might come across a map that is very rare and for which you cannot find any information. This requires an extra step. So let's go over that. So here's a map um, that is very uncommon, a map of the Eastern US. Um, it was actually engraved by King and published by a man named Seaman. Um, looking in Thule's Dictionary of Map Makers, um, you were, I was able to determine um, that you know King was the engraver for Seaman and that Seaman published an atlas in around 1820, 1821. So that gives me a good time frame for when this map was published, in addition to the state boundaries, which would help you guide you as to the date of the map as well. Um, so I evaluated the condition of it. This one had contemporary outline color. Um, that I was able to determine by looking at other examples that I did find online in institutions. Um, and I graded this one a B plus again, lots of B pluses today. <laughs> so when I look for historical sales prices, I found nothing. And when I look for current market prices, I found nothing. So that leads me to say, okay, well now what do I do? Do I just make it up? The best thing to do is to go to step five. You compare it to similar maps. So you need to take a map 
that is of the same geography, right? So here it would be Eastern United States. It needs to be the same time period. Um, depending on when that is, I usually give it plus or minus 10 years. Um, but again, if you're talking about a map that was published right around the American Revolution, 10 years is not gonna be appropriate. You might need to shorten that because something published prior versus after the revolution is going to have a difference in value. Um, also, it needs to be approximately the same size, plus or minus a few inches. So here's a list of, of examples that I found that um, follow all of those parameters. Now, when looking at these, you know, obviously you can see that there's a very wide range of prices, all the way from $70 to $2,000. So the key is to really look at some of the different examples and understand what drove the price for those. So on the, the highest priced one, the one that sold for 2000, that one happens to be a map that shows the state of Franklin, which is a, an important collecting um, category that drove the price for that. So we can really eliminate that price because it's not relevant. Our map does not show that. The very lower priced um, maps, those were all maps that actually didn't even show any state boundaries. So they were relatively generic, very basic maps not very comparable to um, our map in contention. So looking more closely at some of the other um, examples and at the prices of those, I was able to come up with an estimated value of around $275 to $350. Now again, because this is a very rare map and I wasn't able to find any pricing examples, this will be the type of map in which at auction, for instance, you might see erratic results right? Because you don't know how other people are going to feel about it. Are they going to find that it's very interesting or not? Um, and for what reasons? Um, so in an auction environment, you just need two people to drive up the price, right? You always need somebody bidding against you. Um, and so this pricing could be off, but that's kind of a good guess based on similar items that we found. So on this one, um, yeah, so it, it could go a little bit higher than this because it is very rare, but based on the information that's on the map, wasn't that interesting and different from what you would see on similar maps of the time period. So that's how I calculated that. All right, so some final thoughts. Um, first of all, dealers, auctioneers, and collectors do not agree on how much these various factors will affect value. Some will say, oh, contemporary color, well, that doubles the value. Or some will say, no, it only increases it by 10%. Um, so there's a lot of, um, it's not a science in calculating the value of maps. There's a lot of art to it. And that's where it comes into play. Um, so you will see, as a result, a lot of different opinions on what something might be worth based on you know, somebody's experience, who their customers are, where they're based, and what they think is, is fair for that map. The second thing to note is that if you, are, if you have a map and you're searching for it on the internet and you can't find it, it doesn't necessarily mean that it is rare. So even though the internet has given us much more visibility as to the, um, the um, supply on the market, there are a lot of categories of maps that are not um, that are not shown on the internet. So things that don't have a lot of value or there's not a lot of interest in it, you're also not going to find a lot of examples that are offered for sale or that have sold in the past. Um, so some of the examples of these are um, 19th and 20th century maps. Um, a lot of those were published in mass quantities and simply don't have a lot of value because there are just too many of them out there. This includes things like um, National Geographic maps, um, maps from school atlases and geography books, especially the, the 20th century ones, um, 20th century atlas maps, um, a lot of the 20th century road maps, unless they're of really popular cities. A lot of those are not going to have a lot of value, again, because of the number that were, that were published. Um, um, OK. So even if you do have a map that is very rare, it doesn't necessarily mean it's valuable. So, you know, like I said, 
if you find something in, and even if you, if, if it is very rare, unless that there are other people out there who really want it and there's a lot of demand for it, you're not gonna find a lot of value in that map. Um, so I already talked about some of the maps that have very little value, you know, the, the National Geographic maps, the road maps and so on. Um, one of the key exceptions to what I did say was within the um, late 19th and the 20th century, pictorial maps um, tend to have a lot of, a, a lot of value. Um, and those are actually one of the categories that has been increasing in value over the last 10 to 15 years, much more so than many other collecting categories. Um, and those are the maps that are, you know, satirical maps or persuasive maps, things that really show um, the cultural um, elements that are, that are pervasive and the political elements within the society. Um, they tend to be much more graphic and decorative. Um, and so those are the types of maps from the later time period, the more recent maps, the vintage maps, if you will, that do tend to hold their value much more. Um, and one final note is my little public service announcement that just as a reminder, if at all possible, try to examine a map outside of a frame and outside of the matting. If you do have a map that was framed prior to around 1980, um, then I would highly recommend having a framer take a look at it, making sure that the materials that were used, the matting, the backing board, um, the adhesives that were used are archival because if they're not, it's a lot less expensive to have that redone um, by a framer and done archivally than it is to have a map conserved and repaired once it's, it's been damaged over time. And that damage will continue to increase over time as it, as it stays in that frame. So. Um, I always recommend that people take a look at their frames and make sure that their maps are, are well protected inside them. Um, because we do find, like I mentioned before, that the framing materials and the framing techniques are what cause more damage to maps than, we, than, than just about anything else. So I think that's it. And I would be happy to take questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, Eliane. Very useful information. Uh, let's see. If you, somebody, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, that's fine. If you want to put it in the chat, that'll be also fine. So um, let me see if I can see everybody here. Yeah. Let me, why don't you um, stop sharing maybe, Elia, so we can stop see. Stop sharing, everybody. okay. Yeah. And you can also raise your hand electronically or, okay, Miles Crane. <clears throat> First off, Elaine, that was just excellent. Thank you very, very much. Uh, general question on uh, fraud imitation. How does one tell if it's a, um, an original map or a glissé? What would you look for on determining if something is glissé or not? And forgive me if I'm mispronouncing that. So um, there, there are a few <clears throat> important factors to look for. Um, we, there, uh, four key things that I typically look for. Number one is the plate mark, okay? With a copper plate mat, you will almost always have at least somewhat of an impression that goes around the edge of the plate as it was printed on the paper. So looking for that or feeling it, being able to sense it um, by touch is important. Um, you do need to check to make sure that that plate mark matches other examples that you know to be authentic. So for instance, you can go to the Library of Congress. They have digitized you know, a lot of their maps you can find um, in lots of other public libraries. You know, I'm sure Denver has a collection, um, the New York Public Library, Boston Public Library, the, um, the British Library. They all have maps that are digitized online. So if you can find an example within their collections and match the plate mark, that is a really, a really helpful tip. The second thing is looking at the quality of the engraving. So in order to do that, you need to look at the map up close. So under a magnifier, you know, a simple 10x magnifier will do. You're going to want to look for engraved lines that are crisp and clean, that there are no little dots around it, um, which would indicate, you know, potentially that it was um, printed from, you know, modern printing um, mechanism. Um, so looking for those clean, crisp, and separate lines. So I especially look anytime you have lines that are very close together, 
or lines that are cross hatched, right? So that they cross each other. That's where you're best going to be able to identify if you're getting those clean, crisp lines. Most modern printing techniques, though, they will kind of blur and meld together a bit um, and kind of become shadowy in between instead of having those really crisp lines. The third thing I look for is the paper. So paper making changed over the centuries, right? And so if it's a modern made map, it's going to have a very different type of paper than you would expect from um, you know, centuries ago. So being able to take a look at that, sometimes watermarks can help identify. We try to, as much as possible, identify the watermarks that we see on maps um, and call them out um, in our auctions because we're trying to compile essentially a database of the watermarks that were used by, and there are some books that also have this, um, but we're trying to kind of identify different watermarks that are associated with different publishers and map makers. Um, and the fourth thing, now I can't think of it, it'll probably come to me. I have an article on our website. So if you go to our website at the very bottom, there is, um, I can actually show it if I share my screen. Is that okay? Um, yeah, sure. You don't have to log in. You don't have to have a username or a password, anything like that. Um, but if you go to the very bottom of our website, you'll see a thing called recent articles. And if you click on that, you can actually search through it. We have 78 articles on here. There's okay. one. So if you go into, I think it's Map Basics. Here it is, yeah, under Map Basics, so fake news you won't want to miss. So this is an article that goes and talks about the different ways to identify a facsimile versus an original antique map. Now this is mostly just for maps that were printed on copper plate. It's a little bit different if you're talking about a woodblock map or a lithograph is, is much harder to tell. With a lithograph, you really have to know it's really all about the paper. Um, and a little bit about the printing quality, but those are much easier to reproduce um, because they're a more modern printing technique versus the intaglio printing. Um, but there, we have, you know, like I said, almost 80 articles on here about all different topics. We welcome people to use these um, different articles and to read them and to enjoy them. You don't have to log into our website or create a password or anything. They're just there for anybody who's interested. So there's a lot of a wealth of information there. Elaine, thank you again. Very You're welcome. Up. Okay. Uh, question from Bill. Do you use worthpoint.com for sale records? Um, we have recently started looking at them a little bit. I tend to find that they have a lot more eBay prices than other auctions and than, than some of the major auction houses. Um, eBay has very erratic pricing um, from what we've seen. And a lot of that's because you don't have a targeted group of map collectors who understand what the things are that they're selling, as well as collectors who are buying who understand what to look for and what the prices should be and what they can expect. So you're much more likely to get caught buying something that isn't what it's being represented as on eBay. And so that, that kind of leads into the pricing variation. So I haven't used WorthPoint as much for that reason. I find that Rare Book Hub, they, they do all the biggest auction houses. So every large map auction you can think of, their pricing results are on Rare Book Hub. And so we find that they have really an excellent representation of the market, the international market, not just US, it's, it's very broadly international. Okay, thank you, Leanne. Uh, question by Mark, any recommendations when buying a map at auction that is framed where do you don't where you do not have the opportunity to remove it from the frame? My suggestion is always assume that there are condition issues that are hidden and discount the price as a result. Because unless the auctioneer has told you that they have viewed the condition um, or they or the person who consigned it framed it themselves and knows that it was framed using archival methods and museum quality framing and so on. Um, just assume that there are condition problems that you're going to discover when you take it out of the frame and go from there. Good, good recommendations. Uh, Polly Andrews, great presentation. Can you give some recommendations of well-qualified restoration services? 
Restoration in the United States is very tricky. There are not a lot of people who specialize in um, restoring maps. So we have a few that we work with, but a lot of them don't take on new clients because they're so overloaded with work. Um, so I don't have a great recommendation. The only one that I know that some of my customers have worked with, but we've never worked with personally, is Green Dragon. Um, I think it's Green Dragon Bindery. So they do um, binding as, as well as um, paper restoration. Um, so we've seen some things that they have repaired that have come through our auction house and they do nice work, but I can't speak to ever having actually worked with them. Um, but there are a lot more um, conservators in Europe than in the United States. It's simply, there aren't enough people here who do that type of work. So it is unfortunately a huge challenge to try to find people to restore to restore maps. Okay, thank you. Question by Jim, which is a good one. Actually, I had that question at some point. Notes by previous users or dealers in the margins or on the verse in pencil or ink, how do they affect value? Should pencil notes be erased? And, and, and I see this with even the number that they put in there, what, is that an issue? So, you know, like I mentioned when I was talking about condition, you know, in our view, we typically look at things that are in the margins that are outside of the engraved image to not really affect value. Um, so I would say is unless they're, you know, within, you know, sometimes you'll have a dealer stamp or a library stamp that's in the image, that certainly will affect the value. Um, but if it's something in the margins, in the corner of the map, um, you know, the corner of the sheet, not the map itself, but the, the paper, we really don't find, you know, even with our customers that that affects the value. Um, do you erase them if they're in pencil? Um, two things to consider. One is um, if you're going to erase it with pencil, you want to use, um, what is this called? It's like a plastic eraser, polymer. Anyway, it's a special type of eraser. You don't want to use a regular kind of eraser that you will find on the end of, of, of a generic pencil because those are too harsh and they will remove layers of the paper itself and can easily cause tears. So very gently using one of these types of eraser, erasers, which are much, much gentler on the paper, can be used. We typically don't erase them. To us, it kind of helps give um, an idea of the life of the map and um, the provenance, where it came from and where it's been. And so we don't typically erase it for that reason. Okay, uh, Max Peter, how do you evaluate maps that are very far from your office? Um, we do not. Um, so we will have, obviously, people send me photos all the time of maps that they're interested in consigning with us. Um, and usually with a photo, I can tell whether or not a map is authentic. So that's, usually, that's the first thing that I'm always checking for is to determine is this even authentic or not. Um, usually from a photo, I can tell if it's a high enough quality photo. Um, we don't give, we will give kind of a very broad range of value. Um, if we're only seeing a photo, because you can't tell the full condition of a map unless you see it in person. So typically in order for us to give a real estimate of value, we need to be able to see it in person, in person, touch it and feel it and, you know, look at it up, at, hold it up to the light to be able to look at it and see what sort of condition issues there might be that, that might not be readily visible otherwise. Okay, uh, Tom and Melody, you think that you had an excellent presentation. What do you think is the best way to store maps in your home for those of us that hoard? <laughs> um, so, you know, even though I've cautioned quite a bit against framing, I, I'm not against framing. I'm against old framing techniques that are not archival and not museum quality. So frames are a lovely way to be able to present your maps. We have a lot of frame maps on the walls around here and, and we really enjoy them. Um, if you have more than you can fit on the walls, you can just build more walls. No, that's, <laughs> um, if you have more than can fit on the walls, we recommend buying um, archival sleeves. There are a lot of companies that sell these. Three of them that we've used are University Products, Gaylord, and Talas, which is T-A-L-A-S. Um, those three companies, they sell all sorts of archival products, including um, 
folders, so kind of paper folders that are made from archival material, as well as mylar sleeves. So mylar is that clear, I'm sure you're all familiar with the clear plastic sleeves that you can that you see oftentimes. Um, they sell those as well. Um, so those are a great, great way to store it. And you can, you know, we have some customers who will get an easel and they'll put like a, a backing board at the back of the easel, like foam, like a foam board or something. Um, and then just kind of put a stack of maps on top of it, on top of it, and then they can switch them out on occasion. So that's a nice way to be able to look at a map and look at it, you know, at um, a nice eye level height and still be able to rotate out your maps um, in your collection. Um, or some people have um, flat files. So we have here have dozens of flat files where we store all of the maps. Um, you can get nice ones in metal or wood. I typically prefer metal, even though it's not as attractive, but wood can attract more bugs and you certainly don't want that with your maps. Um, so those, those are two of the, the main ways that we see people um, displaying their maps and, and keeping them. Okay, and the last question we have in the chat, why are maps measured to the neat lines? What about maps that extend beyond the neat line? Yes, so um, that is true. So typically maps are measured, it's typically the entire in, engraved area that is measured. Um, and usually that is from neat line to neat line. So usually there's an outer line bordering the map and that is the neat line. Sometimes there are some maps where there's a little bit of of the geographical region that extends outside of the map. Um, I think that people typically measure from neat line to neat line because it is clearer and it's kind of more of a standard way of measuring. Um, and that, that can help you identify, you know, different maps, different editions um, by being able to measure that way. And that's typically how it, they're measured within reference books as well. So if you're using different um, reference books to be able to, um, study your maps, research them. That's typically how they are measured. One, another great question by Jim. Um, what was the most valuable map that you had sold? Um, we, let's see. The most valuable map, I think we sold a map of the Tortugas, um, a sea chart of the Tortugas for around $50,000. That was actually prior. So my husband, John, and I bought the business around 12 years ago. Prior to that, Old World Auctions was owned by Kurt and Marty Griggs, who had also owned the business for around 15 years prior to that. So that was during their tenure that they sold it. Um, last year or two years, one or two years ago, we sold an atlas for um, around 55000 It was a, um, a Vischer atlas, I believe. Um, if I'm not mistaken, that that was in full contemporary color, a world atlas with maps of all the continents and the various regions um, that sold for, yeah, around 55,000. Excellent. Very good. Anybody else before we leave? Uh, how did you get started in evaluating maps? <laughs> um, well, so I got started in the business through my father. He was always a map collector uh, my entire life, and he amassed a, a huge collection of maps. Um, so they were kind of always around the house. And my husband and I decided, um, we went to business school both together. And then after that, we worked for Fortune 500 companies and we decided we really wanted to have our own business. So we were always trying to think of, you know, a business that we could start or a business that we could buy, what could we do? And my father found out about old world auctions being up for sale. So Kurt and Marty Griggs wanted to retire and sell the business and he was a customer of theirs. So he told us about the business and we thought, wow, that's, that's perfect. It, um, you know, I have a, a big background in, um, in art and languages. And my husband has a big background in history. And it was something that we thought, wow, this could be just a really wonderful, wonderful business. So we bought the business from Kurt and Marty and they actually moved, they were in Sedona, Arizona, and they moved to Virginia um, for the first six months and trained us on every aspect of the business, including valuing that. So we got, learned a lot from them, but to be honest, I would say it took at least five years of cataloging 2,000 maps a year for me to become very comfortable with valuing maps. Because like I said, you know, it is a complicated process. There are a lot of different details. There are a lot of factors to consider. Um, and really, 
it takes just a lot of experience to know which factors impact value more than others and how to be able to, to really price maps. So the only thing I now still am uncomfortable with is pricing manuscript maps because they're usually one in a million and so you don't have any comps and it's, it's, they're really difficult to, to determine the value of those. Yeah, well, great business decision here. Um, <laughs> are the PowerPoints available from today's presentation? Naomi, we don't usually do that, right? Um, no. Um, no, the recording will go up. I mean, Eliana, if someone contacts you directly and asks for the PowerPoint, um, you could negotiate that if you'd like to share it. Sure. Do you, can you tell your email? I mean, can you just? Let yeah, it's know? um, it's just my name, Elion Dotson at. Sorry, it's just Elion at OldWorldAuctions.com. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and if if you forget that or or miswrite it, it's it's on our website. Um, or on our website, you can also go to info at oldworldauctions.com and that email comes directly to me. I, I answer all of those emails. So there you have it. If you go to all world um, our auctions, you're gonna know that uh, they were valued by a true expert on this field. <laughs> Thank you so much, Eli. I really appreciate um, uh, such a useful uh, um, presentation. And uh, I had one more question. You said that demand affects the value of, of maps. Um, has demand gone up, gone down with time? Are people still interested on antique maps? Uh, what's your take on that? So I think demand ebbs and flows. Um, it's not steadily growing or steadily declining. We saw a big resurgence in map collecting during the pandemic. Um, and we had, we, I think we increased our bidders by 15, 20% during the pandemic. Um, and the number of new people that were coming to the business. So we were actually seeing a big resurgence in, in collecting. Um, I, so I think it's, it's hard to say, you know, uh, over time it will continue to ebb and flow. Right now, um, there are a lot of collectors out there who are really excited about maps, um, and which makes us happy because we love maps too. And we love to talk about them and, <laughs> and look at them. We feel very lucky that our job is to look at, look at maps and research them and, and write about them every day. It's, it's pretty fun. Excellent. Thank you so much again, and uh, thank you all, and we'll see you at Map Month uh, in uh, May. And, and Naomi will keep you appraised of what's going on. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a good evening.